You will recall that uh, at the end of our, our last session, we were talking about Eric Erickson. And we were talking about you know, the contrast between uh, you know, him and Sigmund Freud, in that you know, Freud's theory, you'll recall, you know, had people you know, constantly striving to deal with all these very primitive feelings that we called the id. But Erickson you know, posited there's really a second source of, of energy, uh, and it can be conflict-free. Uh, that is, it doesn't, it's not necessarily uh, constantly trying to deal with primitive feelings. So that's the energy that, that comes from the ego. And so Eric Erickson had posited there's this separate energy, very important energy, that we have right from birth that exists in the ego. Now today, we're going to move to the fifth stage in Erickson, and it's called adolescence. And, you know, perhaps uh, adolescence and, and the theory of adolescence proposed by Erickson is, is what distinguished him most from other psychoanalytic analytic theorists. In fact, he is quoted more often than any other individual for having appreciated the importance uh, of the stage uh, of adolescence, and also for having understood how much adolescence is involved in preparing a person for adulthood. Now, it, you know, if you think about this, you know, re recall your own adolescence. Uh, almost certainly, you can, uh, as you reflect back, you can think of some risks that you took. And you might think about like how frightened you were at times uh, in trying something new, and how important it was for you uh, to be part of your social group. In fact, this is the time in life where uh, you know, we posit that a young person really begins to develop an identity. And, and it's time that an individual begins to feel, I really am somebody. Now, what can make you know, this stage uh, difficult is that if one has had really significant failures in the previous stages we discussed, then one often is still devoting a lot of energy to trying to resolve earlier issues, and they have less energy uh, to really get involved in this stage. And, and the reason that's important is that you know, this is a stage where uh, you know, young people certainly have very intense sexual feelings. And they begin to wonder, how can I express these feelings safely? And, and also there's that wonder about, how can I be valued uh, in an intimate relationship uh, by another person? And, so the individual is not only uh, developing a sense of identity in terms like of whether they, they are sexually desirable or sexually competent, but at the very same time, this is the period where there's an emphasis on work, or that is in many societies. In, in our society, it's more an emphasis on career development. And this is the time when so often youngsters are asked, what will they be? Uh, as if when you're 16, you should be able to figure out what are you going to be? Uh, but there's a lot of pressure on youngsters, and that question is often asked, uh, if not by parents, by aunts and uncles, and by other significant people. Uh, and, and that's a lot of pressure. So, and the complexity uh, that exists in this stage is so profound that very few people fail to struggle during their adolescence. And what they struggle with is role confusion. Thus, we could posit that it, there's anxiety and uncertainty that flows from, from role confusion, and that actually that anxiety is, is probably normal, in, in the statistical sense at least, that most people experience it. Uh, it's normative. It's what ordinarily happens during adolescence. And if the experience does not become overwhelming, then the, an adolescent is able to develop a sense of who or she, he or she really wishes to be. And then that's when they form 
an acceptable identity. Now, there are lots of complexities, as I mentioned, that come at this time. One of them is that parents often begin to relive their own hopes through the lives of their children. Thus, children sometimes appear to resolve this stage uh, easily because they will announce they've chosen a career. They're going to be an attorney. They're going to get a doctorate. Uh, they're going to enter the family business, which usually is very pleasing to the parents. However, such choices are sometimes more passive than really is healthy for a young person who is trying to discover uh, himself or herself. And if the child has not really struggled with the, the potentials uh, in his or her life and come to a serious decision, then this may come up later. For instance, it is not uncommon that a seemingly secure child ends this period with a clear identity and an occupational choice. Like, looks like they've really solved this. Only to raise serious questions about it later in their life. And indeed, it is, it is common that people in their late 30s and 40s come into psychotherapy, uh, really expressing a lot of confusion about the career choice that they made. And they begin to realize, I never really thought enough uh, about what I wanted to do. Part of that means I never really listened enough to my internal life. That is, I never listened enough to me, to who I was, to what I wanted to be. I just decided to be what it seemed people would like me to be. And now I am unhappy in that stage, uh, in that field, in, in the work that I'm doing. Uh, and so it becomes terribly important during this stage that young people be allowed to struggle, that we not put too much pressure uh, on people. And you know, if you, you think about, uh, you know, in your college life, if you know the statistics, a person comes out of high school and often uh, there has been this pressure. Maybe each of you have experienced it in your life. You're supposed to announce to the family like, well, why are you going to college? And what are you going to get there? And what are you going to be after you're done? Now, we know that the average student in college actually changes majors 1.6 times. That's just average. So, so it means that when somebody comes into college, and you know how uh, when you come in, they always ask you, what are you going to major in? Even if you don't know what you're going to major in, they say, well, tell us something. Well, after you, know, you get exposed to a lot of things, you meet new friends, uh, you find there are fields you never heard about. I mean, you may know nothing about architecture, but you stumble into it. Uh, you may have no idea what anthropology was when you came in, but now you find this is a very exciting field. Uh, you may never have thought much about finance, but now you find yourself getting intrigued by it. So the, the exposure you have in college, uh, you know, in a healthy person, causes a person often to make a fairly significant change. And it is not uncommon that somebody makes that change a couple of times while they're in college because they discover things that they did not know uh, were available to them. I can tell you I was one of those people. Uh, when I was uh, entered undergraduate school, I was going to major in philosophy. Went into an honors philosophy program. Uh, and I thought that's what I wanted to do. Uh, by accident, I was taking two courses way across campus. One at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, one at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and quite literally, since it was too far to walk back to the dorms, I decided what I will do is I'll, I'll see if there's a course over on the other side of campus at 3 o'clock. I mean, literally, I was just filling in a blank. And I found that there was this course in child psychology that was taught right after my 2 o'clock course, so I took it. I had absolutely no idea what psychology was. Uh, I just was totally feeling I just need to get some hours in. Well, I had this wonderful teacher who not only taught uh, child psychology, but part of the course required you to do uh, some kind of social service. That is, once a week, you had to go to some child facility and play with children and make observations about children and try to be helpful. And I got signed, uh, assigned to an orphanage. And I used to go there on Wednesday afternoon. And I found you know, these incredibly needy kids 
who as soon as you got to the front door, these kids would run and jump on you. They were about 8 to 12. And, and they, were, they were just so hoping that somebody would be affectionate with them and caring, etc. Well, I found this, you know, especially compared to philosophy at the time, which is you know, very abstract and no emotion. And here I've got these really needy kids. Well, at, by the time I finished that course, uh, I realized I was much more interested in that world that I had discovered there. And so I changed my field and I went into psychology. And I was already a senior. Now, I think you know, that this is the kind of experience we're talking about. And, and it's unfortunate if one comes into college and one's not allowed to have that kind of experience because the family has so much put pressure on a person that you feel you, you've simply got to go in a certain direction. And as I say, if that happens, it, it takes about 10 years. But after a while, people really begin to question and to say, why did I ever do this? And then uh, you know, they begin to examine themselves in a more profound way. Now, if there wasn't enough going on in this stage, uh, with parents sometimes making the stage difficult uh, for children, adolescents themselves are notorious for the rigid expectations that they have of each other. If you remember back, uh, perhaps when you were in high school, that if you're in a club, clubs tend to have rigid rules for membership. Uh, often clothes have to be a certain way. Uh, language, especially slang, you know, changes a lot. And you have to keep up with it, because if you don't, you're not you know, really someone who is, is current and with it. Uh, and young people often worry that they will embarrass themselves by not being in tune with social expectations. So, you know, this really is a, a tough time for, uh, for people. And as they said, I think you know, it, it's normative that someone struggle in this stage. It's probably, uh, from all we know now, a very good thing that people struggle in this stage. And too often parents are not aware that, that that's just fine that that's what goes on in that period. So trying to take all the uncertainty and anxiety out of the life of an adolescent is probably not doing that person a favor because it's, it's bringing very significant life decisions uh, prematurely to a closure when perhaps the person ought to struggle further, uh, ought to be exposed to more things before they make these important decisions. Now, sure, Ms. Lee. What was the virtue in number five? Uh, the virtue in number five is egos, is fidelity, excuse me. We haven't quite, uh, I'll mention it in a minute, but uh, the crisis is identity versus role confusion. The ego strength that we're going to get to uh, is called fidelity. Now, Erickson observed that the anxiety of this stage can be so overwhelming that adolescents sometimes engage in what is called totalism. Uh, totalism is T-O-T-A-L-I-S-M. And totalism is characterized by a commitment to a, a rather simplistic ideology that tends to offer very simple answers to rather profound questions. And the important aspect of totalism is that it greatly reduces anxiety by creating a sense for the adolescent, the adolescent that the person has answers to problems that induce anxiety and create insecurity. So if you can develop this sense of totalism, then you think you have all the answers. And how many adolescents do we know who have all the answers? Uh, that's a mechanism sometimes when we observe it that you know, frustrates us as we find somebody feels they know everything. But for that person, that's, that's a great reducer of anxiety. Now Erickson proposed that the resolution of the crisis of adolescence led to what he called fidelity, which actually means the youngster develops an ability to sustain loyalties and be involved with other people while recognizing that life is not simple. In other words, the young person learns to accept 
there are contradictions in value systems. That is, not everyone thinks as he or she does, and that he or she will not be destroyed by differing with other people. So that it's okay not to agree with everyone. Now, what Erickson observed was that if, if you don't develop this virtue, then you may develop a negative identity, which often leads to a need to reject everyone who is not rigidly like the individual and his or her friends. So you get you know, a group of people, they all think the same way, they all hang out together, uh, and they do that often because they have a negative identity, meaning that they can't allow anything new into their lives because it creates too much anxiety. Now such people, if, if they continue this arrested development throughout their life, these become your people who you know, later on establish country clubs uh, with rigid restrictions about who can belong. Or they, they have neighborhoods that only permit a certain type of person. Or they set uh, economic uh, and or, or social status as the goals of life because they, they are much too frightened to be uh, more intimate, to be creative, to think about the excitement of being all-inclusive, uh, that to uh, realize that they might want to be friends with just anybody is just also overwhelming. In the extreme, by the way, of course, you get groups uh, you know, like the Ku Klux Klan, I mean, who come up with all kinds of, of rules. And you know, if you observe uh, in, you know, in some of the, the well-done documentaries that have been made about the Klan, I mean, you can't help but observe that group and realize uh, you know, how limited emotionally, intellectually, and psychologically the, these members are. I mean, the rigidity that they have which so many of us, you know, tends to create a, you know, a profound dislike, uh, you know, in us towards them. And, and part of that, of course, you know, is the reaction that this is a group that's so unfair. But given their limited, you know, emotional and intellectual resources, this is their solution to how somehow they resolve this crisis by saying they are really important, even though the rest of us are saying they sure are not important. And in fact, we don't like them at all. Now the next stage that comes, the sixth stage, is called young adulthood. And this is really a significant contribution to personality theory and to our understanding also of, of psychopathology because previous theorists hadn't really got this far. And this spans the ages you know, from 20 to 24, approximately. And what Erickson posited here was that once a person has resolved much of this tumult of adolescence, they are able to engage in what he said was true intimacy. Now, you notice, as we described adolescence, I mean, there really is a, a great deal of anxiety that uh, comes in adolescence, and it, it's very hard uh, for people to get through all of those conflicts. But if they can, then they're ready for true intimacy. And Erickson made important distinctions between the ability to be sexual with another person and the experience of being truly intimate. He noted that intimacy only occurs with someone you truly know that you can experience in multiple ways. And it has to be a person with whom you can feel safe. He actually defined such relationships as having the following parameters. And like so often when you take a complex phenomena and you try to come up with uh, a description, the description is, uh, you know, is overly wordy. But here's his description of the parameters of intimacy. A mutuality of orgasm with a loved partner of the opposite sex with whom one is able and willing to share a mutual trust and with whom one is able and willing to regulate the cycles of work, procreation, and recreation so as to secure to offsprings all the stages 
of a satisfactory development. If you look at it carefully enough, it's pretty stereotypical, actually. Uh, but he is trying to include a lot of things, and, and immediately there are some things in here I hope that you would react against. Uh, but you want to consider that Erickson was a person of his times. Now you'll notice that the narrowness uh, in this, in the sense that to establish a true intimacy, you had to do it heterosexually. Uh, obviously, that's a flaw in his theory. And it's important to, to recall that much of the theorizing of Erickson occurred during a time when the uh, American Psychoanalytic Association had listed anything homosexual as being pathological. It is much later, after this theory is long developed, that the clinical world, that is psychologists and psychiatrists, really came to the understanding that this stage can be a normal developmental stage, that is, being gay, and does not have to have anything to do with psychopathology. Now, and, and by the way, most uh, you know, therapists and the theorists today recognize that uh, mature, intimate adult relationships can occur in both heterosexual and homosexual people. The key remains the same in these relationships, namely that the people are sensitive to each other, they're committed to each other, they truly understand the needs of each other, and they are not frightened or withholding in regard to their sexual involvement. Now, this developmental phase is particularly important for young people who fail to resolve it. The reason is that the alternative usually is isolation. When a person actually gives up intimacy, and, and what, why do they give up intimacy? Because they seek a life that will not be painful. They find that they haven't been successful in being intimate, and so they decide, you know, I'm not going to pursue that because it just hurts too much. Now, there are a lot of implications if, if this is the resolution. Uh, it may limit a person uh, and their freedom to choose jobs, since isolated individuals you know, tend to, to join professions where they can keep significant distances from people. And, you know, there, there are a lot of professions, you'd be surprised, you know, even professions that seem to be people-oriented can actually uh, allow you a lot of distance. Uh, you can see that, by the way, right here in a university where you may find a professor uh, who actually might be quite popular uh, with students because, after all, you can, you can keep a very safe distance if you want uh, as a professor from the students by always claiming you're the professor and they're the students. But what happens with some people who become very popular with students but they keep a very rigid line is that that's their whole life. If you were to look at this professor's life beyond the university, you would find out there is nothing. This person has no intimate life. Uh, this person doesn't relate to anyone other than students. This person really can't operate except in an environment where the person feels that that individual is in control and the other people kind of have to do what he or she wants even if they don't want to. Now that's a, a horrible resolution of intimacy, but unfortunately you really do see this in, in, in lots of people. Another way you might see it is some of you may have like a favored aunt that never married, a favored uncle that never married. They may be really a nice person. They may actually be very good to you. But they, they could never get to the stage of really being intimate with a peer. So they become kind of everybody's favorite aunt or uncle who, you know, is, works at a job and they, they're faithful to their job and they do their job well and they're, they're gracious. Uh, they, they may be your, your godparents and they may have other roles in your life. Uh, you may have very fond feelings towards them. Uh, they're always somebody you have over at the holidays. But when you look at their life, you realize there is nothing else. This person does not have any intimate friends. Now, if we look at the other hand, for the person who really develops a capacity for intimacy, this person develops the, the virtue uh, and the ego strength that Erickson would call love. And this means that the young adult can truly give of himself or herself to another person. And they can do it even if it creates anxiety. 
and they can take the chance that the reward of intimacy is worth the anxiety and the uncertainty that they may need to experience you know, in order to attain this goal. So they're willing to take risks. They, they realize that uh, these can be uh, trying times, but they, they have the ego strength to, first of all, to thrust themselves into the relationship, and secondly, uh, you know, to stay with the uncertainty at times it comes in all complex relationships. Now, if one then resolves this stage, we go on to the next stage, which is called middle adulthood. And this is the seventh stage now that we're talking about, and and it spans the years approximately like 25 to 64. Uh, this is very arbitrary, the age is, because that tends to be the span of, adult, of an adult's working life. And uh, this was written during a time when people re had to retire at age 65. So there was this kind of artificial time where, you know, your, your working life was probably started, uh, or certainly about to start, when you were around 25 years old. Uh, maybe it started a little earlier, it might start a little later if you went to graduate school, etc. But then you worked your whole life. And so he built this theory around what happens between when you start working up until the time that you would retire, which he designated as age 65, and, and indeed the culture did at the time. Now Erickson believed that parenting, in its broadest sense, was the major issue during this long developmental stage. And he used the term generativity to refer to an inner desire in each of us, not only to create and physically nurture the next generation, but also to develop uh, things like art, ideas, creative products in our work. So parenting could really mean, it, the focus on generativity in parenting, was, in parenting was creating children and helping children to grow. But you also might put that same energy, if you weren't having children, for instance, into art or into your work or into something where you can be creative and you can make the world a better place. Now, throughout this stage, the issue for people is whether they are successful in being generative or whether they may have used up all their energy and all the things that we've talked about in the previous stages and then they don't have much left to give to this stage. Now Erickson said, if this happens, if you kind of don't have much to give to this stage, you're still trying to resolve all those things that went on earlier, then you stagnate. And he feels that these people are not true contributors in adult life. If a person, on the other hand, is able to experience themselves as generative, Erickson posited they develop the virtue or the ego strength of care, which means a person contributes to the culture in which he or she lives. And it, it's important to note that Erickson did not believe one necessarily had to have children in order to be successful in this stage. Rather, he believed a person had to contribute to society, whether it was through generating a family, as I mentioned earlier, generating progress in work, or, or finding some way to contribute to, to the social good, which you could be you know, running for public office or doing things for uh, various organizations that are, are very oriented to improving society. But, but he felt that you, you have to see, in a true adult, some signs of creativity. As you can imagine, it's also possible that someone might have children and still not at all be creative or generative. That uh, it may be that one parent does all the work or it may be that neither of the parents are doing the work. And of course, as a result, the children often uh, end up with, with multiple problems because they have parents who are struggling with all those problems earlier in life and they're not ready to have children. Now then, the stage after this Excuse me. This is the eighth stage, and for Erickson it was the final stage. And it began about age 65 and it, and it extended to death. And he saw it as a time of great reflection, in which people, people often they look back and they examine their life to see if they 
of what they have done actually truly contributed to the improvement of their culture. In other words, did I make a difference? This period involves reflection about the ability of individuals to recognize that, first of all, they have not accomplished all the things in their life that they wish to do. Uh, that, that's a, a very you know, profound and important thing that people have to resolve in their later years, and that is no one really accomplishes all the things they hope to accomplish. But one can come to grips with the fact that one still has been generative, that uh, one has made a difference, that the world uh, in which one lives, or the culture, or the street on which one lives, or the, the interpersonal environment in which one lives, has improved because I have made contributions. Now, if, if one gets to that point and really feels, you know, I have done some very good things and, and I'm pleased with what I have done, even though I know I didn't do all I wanted to, Erickson says they developed the virtue that he calls ego integrity. And it means the person believes that th their life is worthwhile and they are prepared uh, for death whenever it inevitably comes, because this is a time when people do much more recognize that, that death is coming, that they have lived more of their life than they have life left to live. And, uh, and, and this is a, a period where it becomes very important for people to be able to like what's in their past, as well as, by the way, to look forward what they still are going to do. Now, if a person does all this reflection I'm mentioning, and they fail to find anything meaningful in their life, they don't think they've really done, then Erickson felt this is when people develop a sense of despair. And it's because they feel it's too late to start over and death is too near. Now, the virtue that is associated with meaningfulness uh, in old age, with, with, with feeling like one is doing well, is called wisdom. And Erickson defined wisdom as a detached concern with life itself in the face of death itself. Now, what you would want to know, and those, have any of you taken any gerontology courses? Well, the field of gerontology has really, uh, you know, studied older adults. And what we've really discovered is there are a lot of things that go on after age 65 than, than Erickson posited. Uh, many people continue to be very creative. They contribute new ideas and they continue to grow uh, and, and they foster growth in others. Uh, they don't just simply reflect on their past. I mean, if you take older people who you might identify uh, as having been very creative, who, who do you think about? Who comes to mind if you think about somebody who's very alive or was very alive when they were alive and they were well beyond 65? Anybody come to mind? So you probably think everybody who's past 50 is so old that 65 is not a marker. Okay. How about um, Jimmy Carter? Yeah. Jim, yeah, here, Jimmy Carter. He's in his 70s. What do you think? He's out building houses for poor people. Uh, he's out trying to, you know, to do things in, in other countries that might uh, help bring peace. How about Gandhi? Wouldn't Gandhi be someone you would think about? Mother Teresa. Yes, Mother Teresa in her 80s. You know, working with these people who were so sick and so ill. I mean, you, you really can't distinguish Mother Teresa in many ways from when she was in her 50s and when she was in her 80s. She just kept on with this incredible energy, kept doing all of these things. Uh, also, there are people like <coughs> in fields like the arts, like Katherine Hepburn, <coughs> who was you know, acting and, and being very successful as an actress when she was well into her 70s. Uh, there's Margaret Thatcher after uh, she finished being Prime Minister of England. I mean, she's still been very active on the international scene. So you can see how artificial it is to say, well, a person gets to be about 65 or a person retires from whatever job they had. It doesn't mean the person ends their, their creative life. 
And, and we're beginning to, to understand that and to appreciate the fact that we just haven't studied, uh, you know, people. I, I remember, in fact, in my own family, my father died at age 90. And when he was in his 80s, we were all worried about, you know, like, is, is dad going to get depressed? Uh, and I remember one day asking him, I said, you know, do you ever think about death? And he says, no, you know, I really don't. And I said, well, I was just wondering. And he says, well, what I should tell you is, and when I was young, I, it never entered my mind I would live to be 65. So when I got to be 65, uh, I felt I was cheating every day I stayed alive. So now I've been cheating for more than 15 years. Uh, I feel wonderful. And he was. He was a very upbeat, eager, happy person. Uh, but he took the position that uh, this was a bonus. So why should he be concerned about death? Uh, most people, and many of his peers, of course, had died, so he felt I should have died a long time ago. It was a very healthy way, really, to deal with this. Now, there also is research, by the way, to show us that this period, that is after 65, may differ uh, for women than men. Often, at age 65, you know, we observe that in women, they are, are, are feeling actually very excited, very energetic. Uh, they don't have to worry about being pregnant anymore. Uh, they don't have to uh, take care of children anymore. Uh, they may have retired from their job. So it, it's a real freeing up time for them. And, uh, and they, uh, they often are very adventurous. Uh, women uh, may want to do more things. They, they may want to travel more. Uh, they may be sexually freed up and, and may want to be more active sexually, especially since they have time, they can be relaxed, their husband is there. On the other hand, we find that some men, when they get to be 65, uh, let, and, and we should really put in retire when they retire, whatever that age is, so if it's 70 or whatever, but when they retire, they really retire. They feel, I've worked all this time, I've struggled through all these years, now I want to relax and I want to be passive. And I feel I have taken care of my children and my job and my employees and now I want to be taken care of. So here we have this couple. They've been married a long time. We've got this woman who is excited and still generative and wants to do a lot of things, a lot of adult things. And now we've got the guy who wants to be taken care of. He wants to regress and go back and be like a child. So you can imagine there are conflicts that come in marriage at times like this. And we never thought much about marital therapy for people who were 70, but at times that becomes a very important intervention. And it is much more common that the problem is the male partner than it is that it's the female partner. Now, if therapy uh, happens, or if, if, if people are just reflective and, and the male realizes there's something wrong, that the healthy outcome, obviously, is for the husband to recognize that there are many opportunities for adventure and to really become more involved with his spouse and to uh, recognize that uh, the real excitement of later life is not just simply to become a couch potato and to be taken care of. Uh, but it, it, it's fascinating when you, if you look in the psychological literature, up until fairly, you know, recent times, no one wrote about this because th there really was a bias against older people. And people thought, whatever those older people are doing, they're dying off, <laughs> nothing much is going on. And so uh, there wasn't a lot of attention to them. Now, consistent with, with Erickson's view that, you know, the growth in life is an intensely interpersonal uh, experience. He felt that psychotherapy is an intensely interpersonal experience. So his belief was that therapy should be face-to-face, -face, that the therapist uh, should be highly interactive, so he's very different than the traditional uh, psychoanalysts, and he felt that a major focus in psychotherapy should always be on interpersonal relationships. If you notice, as we went through the stages, almost every crisis that is described has something to do with are you being effective interpersonally 
or are you having difficulty uh, interpersonally? And so the, the issue that becomes really key for him is to help people to learn to, first of all, listen to their internal life. And then secondly, to be able to recognize uh, anxieties that get in their way if their internal life is, is difficult for them. And they go from there then to, to be able to overcome whatever it is that, uh, whatever anxiety is, is raised and to move on to the next stage. And if you can't get there, psychotherapy can help you. And it's a relationship with the therapist uh, that's going to be very helpful in getting you into this stage. Now, there are many other psychoanalysts, and we're not going to take them because you can take them in other courses, but I wanted to be sure to give you a, a sense of, you know, what happened in the early days when psychology, and <coughs> clinical psychology in particular, began to develop a sense of who are these people we work with. And as I say, it's a short period of time that we've had. But in that short period of time, thinking has changed dramatically from one period to another. And the next person that we're going to talk about is a clinical psychologist by the name of Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers uh, has had a tremendous impact, really, in the field of intervention, because you'll find that as we we talk about him and as we go through his theory, Rogers not only appealed to you know, professional uh, therapists, but his theory was understandable enough that uh, he appealed uh, since to uh, ministers and to priests, to nuns, to uh, people who, who had a lot of counseling as part of their life. Uh, he appealed to school counselors. Uh, later, you'll see in his life, he appealed to educators in general. That is, his theory will evolve, as you'll see from when he was a therapist, uh, to developing a theory of therapy, to developing a theory about people, and then to developing a sense about how his theory could apply to a, a very broad world, not just people who come in uh, to see a therapist. So Rogers uh, you know, is, is just truly a, a very significant psychologist uh, in the history of clinical psychology. And when he uh, you know, first started, he started at uh, Ohio State, uh, I believe was one of his early places. He went to the University of Chicago, then he went to the University of Wisconsin. But uh, during the times uh, that wherever he was, he was always an innovator. And one of the interesting things was, I think part of the reason why he moved was that there were often lots of other psychologists who couldn't accept his innovations that he was moving the world too fast, and not everybody could keep up with that. Now, he is the founder of what we call client-centered therapy. And actually, you'll see it at the beginning of his work, it was actually called non-directive therapy. And his theory really emphasized the experiences of individual persons. And he saw that as the center for learning about human personality. He, he really believed each person was unique. And if you want to learn about personality, what you really want to do is study individual people. And his person-centered approach, or his belief, was in the unique potential of each individual. And it's rooted, actually, in his religious beliefs. Uh, he didn't start uh, this kind of thinking when he started studying psychology, he actually was a seminarian uh, as a youngster. And it was really from studying theologians and thinking about religious variables that caused him to develop this. And, and so, you know, and his, his theory is heavily focused on helping individuals to free themselves so they can discover their unique identity. And, and you'll see at times as we're, we're talking about Rogers that you, you, you'll be able to see there's a lot of things that you can reflect back and say, well, Erickson also thought many of those things. And, and as we go through uh, Rogers, you know, you'll see that the whole idea of identity is very important. Who am I? Only he was especially focused on someone understanding who they were uniquely. 
Now, there are aspects of, of existentialism that are, are key concepts in this person-centered theory because uh, Rogers, as I said, was heavily influenced, uh, you know, theologically. And I'm just going to have to change our, our slides here. It'll take a second. Okay, here's our first slide. And Rogers uh, had three ideas about how his approach had similarities to existentialism. The first thing, what well, he taught about being conscious of the self and being able to choose at every moment. Now, if you study existentialism, you know that existentialism is a philosophy very much in the here and now. And it, it's very much about people being able to understand themselves and being able to, to focus on what is going on in the current environment and respond to it. Then the second uh, similarity is the idea that men and women, or a man or a woman, is being. And by being, he meant that, you know, people are constantly evolving. That, you know, you should not think of yourself as a static person. That you will always be uh, the way you are now. But rather that, you know, you are the good person you are now. But that you will have experiences that will open up life for you. And you will become uh, a different person. Hopefully a better person. But that, you know, you constantly are evolving. And... He also had the notion that each person has the capacity to transcend the self and the physical world. And by that, he meant you can aspire to more than you are now, and you should not allow yourself to be limited simply by the things that are around you. That you can overcome that, and you can do more. And you can do it now. Now, this then is the beginning of Rogers' theory. And in our next class, we're going to go on to really develop the, the whole sense of how his theory unfolds. But we'll take a break.